Welcome to Tina Tony. We're cute mates. And this is how much time I've got. Oh, this is a problem because really? you could hear it. Yeah, 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 yeah. So TNT, what is TNT? We are two friends, I guess. <laughs> We've been cube mates for 10 years. We sit across from each other. Well, let's get it straight. You're teen. I'm teen. I'm Tony. Yeah. Now, when you said, let's name it TNT, yeah. were you thinking teen Tina first? Tony. And Tina and Tony? <laughs> I always think Tina and And then I said to you, no, let's make it TNT. Tony and T. But <laughs> TNT is fine. Yeah, TNT is fine. So who are you? I'm uh, Teen Brunel. I work at the Dr. Phil Show with Tony Verga. I'm a mom of uh, two kids. They're both actors. Yeah, I've seen them. <laughs> and we're, we're cube mates. We sit next to each other. We sit across from each other. Right. Right. And we've done it seven, eight, nine years. A long time. And for the first eight years, we never spoke. <laughs> you never spoke to anybody. You were kind of rude to me. No, that's not true at all. You know what? I wouldn't say rude, but I like to work when I'm at work. I'm very focused. I'm calling you on that because a lot of your working is ordering things online. <laughs> right. Do you remember one time I said, how you doing, teen? And you were like, good. Mm -hmm. And you never said to me in eight years, <laughs> how are you doing? Because I always feel like I, when I really want to know, I'll ask. I don't feel like you should ask if you don't want to know. But now when I come in, I say, Tony, how are you doing? And I really want to know what's going on. Was it, it me for eight years that just bothered you? Or did you, have you grown as a person? Because by the way, I wasn't the only person you know who what? was like, teens crazy. She, she's just miserable. You know. Oh, I, I, really? That's a rookie mistake. I know. <laughs> you left your phone on in the studio. Just in case there was an emergency. And you have a weird backstory. The way you met your husband, you have two kids who are actors or in the industry. So you know, I'm the sort of person that when I think about something, I do it. A lot of people have dreams like, oh, I wish I could do that. And I'm just like, if I want to do it, I just go ahead and do it. So when I got married, it was the time in my life where I said, I'm going to get married and have kids. How did you meet your husband? <laughs> <laughs> I met my husband on Craigslist. And it happened Come on. because, <laughs> and that was 15 years ago. I met my husband on Craigslist because I had posted a note that said, what are the odds that I'm going to meet somebody? Because I had just gotten out of two relationships with people who were introduced to me through friends. One was at work and one was like, oh, you got to meet this guy. He's an airline pilot. He's the best friend of my best friend. Right. And I thought, if these are the people you think you know, right. then a stranger could be better. I could shoot an arrow in the sky and meet somebody better. Than Just me. so you know, I don't buy furniture from people on Craigslist. <laughs> so the fact that you met a guy. I get everything on Craigslist. You come over my house, all my furniture. I buy, sell. I I have no fear. Of Did that. you get you got married on TV or something? You there was a TV show TV. somehow. <laughs> After I met him on Craigslist, there's only two guys that I met because you get a lot of like uh, photos of naked guys and fat guys and penises, and I only met him and one other guy. It was a guy with like one eye, and it was only because <laughs> I was fascinated okay. to meet the guy with one eye. So I was with Jake for we dated a year, we lived right. together a year, and I said, "I'm 35. It's time to get married," and he did not want to get married. He wanted to live the Tim Robbins, you know, we're yeah. going to be together forever, have kids. I said, no, awesome. I want to have kids. And to have kids, I want to be married. So I wanted to be married. He did not want to break up. I went on Craigslist. <laughs> and then there was wow. an advertisement for, are you at a point in your life where you can't make a decision? If so, come on our show. And I applied. They brought us in. They really liked us. And the whole premise of the show is everything is done by the roll of the dice. Do or dice. Okay. Do or dice was the name of the yes, show. Yes, yes. Later on, they didn't tell us the name of the show. Wow. But you have to make every decision, either break up or get married. So I said, okay. And then they called us in a week later and Jake said, I don't want to do the show. Mm. They showed me a stack of people they had met. We've met all these people. Bravo has only approved you. You have to do the show. Mm. They were going to pay us, I think, $3,500. Oh, you, he was doing the show. And he One said, thing I know about you, <laughs> he was doing the show. He could, like, weekend at Bernie's. He could have been dead, but you would have made him do that show. For he me. said, no. He goes, guess what? I'll roll the dice. If it says evens, I'll do it. Odds, I won't do right. it. He rolled the dice. No. They said 4500 No. 5500 No. 6500 No. He rolled again. $7,500. Yes. I'll do the show. Oh. So they paid us $7,500. And right before shooting day one, Jake said, 
no matter what the dice says, we'll get married and oh, we'll be together. That's romantic. So it made him come to that decision that he did not want to break up. Right. So then when we got on the show, we rolled the dice and we got married a week later. Well, you know, you doubled the money, right? <laughs> yeah. So he was like, this girl is going to be great. They were great. They paid for the rings. They paid for the outfits. They paid for right. the whole thing. Right. Wow, that's that's cool. 15 years later, we have two kids. Now, you're you, you're not from California. You're from Kansas or someplace. I'm like, from Michigan. Oh, Michigan. And you're okay. from New York. I'm a New Yorker. I moved out here uh, 24 years ago, uh, next month will be 24 years in TV. But I started in radio in New York, like as a disc jockey in Bennington, Vermont, <laughs> WHGC in 1981. The funny thing is we've known each other this long yeah. and I've never known this. That's because you didn't talk to me for seven years. You could you could care less. But I started in radio and then I, w I was on the air for a few years. When I tell kids now we work with, I was a DJ, they're like, you mean in a club? Yeah. Like they don't get that there used to be a guy sitting in a farmhouse actually spinning records in, right. in the country. How did you make the transition from radio to TV? Well, I was booking guests on an AM morning show, WABC in New York. You know, I was producing it. One of my contacts over at NBC TV, I had to go through her to book Al Roker and to book Sue Simmons and anything NBC was doing. When I got fired, I called her. She goes, you should be in TV. I go, yeah, exactly. But all my skill set is radio. Right. She goes, I'll teach you TV business. Then I, I came out to hard copy and I worked during sweeps. They wanted somebody to help place their talent on radio. And because I was a radio guy, I would book their talent you know, in the top 10 markets every morning during sweeps. So then they offered me a job on the news desk. Hard copy said, we want to hire you away from Linda. And we want to hire you as a full-time person on our news desk because that's your background. Right. I said, this is great. So they hired me. I moved out to New York. Was uh, our boss on hard copy at that time? Our boss was <laughs> at hard copy at that time. And she knew me. I've known our boss, Carla, for years. Right. But... Once I signed my contract, she she went to ET. So I've been in hard copy. I started in August of 95. I left in August of 98. Then I went to Ripley's Believe It or Not for four years. The best job in the world. Because <laughs> everybody was freakish and fun and embraced it. You know what I mean? Right. That They're, was a great show. People yeah. have missed out on the greatness of Ripley's Believe It or Not. I and mean, all these people that. are still... Of the ones who haven't passed, right. they're still a little freakish. Yeah. They have more tattoos. You know what I mean? They have more things they Remember collected. that era of That's Incredible yes. and Ripley's Believe It or Not? Yeah. And that's where we learned about, you know, the, the guy that was blind and could ride on the bike. And yeah. I mean, and write a million words on yeah. a grain of yeah. salt. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always found that to be. And Fran Tarkington. <laughs> yeah. Was I, I just loved it. And then when I got to Phil. Um, you know, it, that was a fun job, but right. you know, it's anytime you're at a job for a long time, it's like, wow, it's, it's been a good run because I know people who've been out here since I've met them, let's say they've had 20 jobs. They're always looking for work. Right. I get an email from them five times a year. Hey, I just wrapped a seven week gig at GRB. I'm looking for, I can't live like that. I was never a freelance guy. You but know sometimes I, mean? I think like, I'm still satisfied with my job and what mm. I do. And you're always looking at me like, what are we doing, Tien? What are we doing here? Mm. If I was a fireman for 16 years, I'd say the same thing. Yeah. It's just a long time to do the same thing. And like you say, you don't you don't even say hello to people until they're there for a couple of yeah. years. I see the new crew come in and I'm like, oh, they're not gonna last. <laughs> like I have a big heart, believe it or not. I'm like, oh, she's too nice. She's too sweet. She's gonna get she's going to get devastated. I know. They're always mentioning names. You know, Susan, I'm like, I have no idea who that is. And then, then we have to describe them. You know, she has the blonde hair. She's kind of cute. She limps. I'm like, no. Oh, yeah. Oh, the limper. <laughs> yeah. So that's who we are, right? right? So I guess we're different. I'm a talker. You're not a talker. I get in trouble for talking. Right. And then I'm married. Like and school. then you are not married, but you've been with the same person now for how long? I've been with uh, Naoko. When you say person. Right. I don't want, <laughs> I've been with a woman now. Go July 3rd will be our 19th year. 19 years. Now, you see, that's the thing. You right. want to live that Tim Robbins life. No, because we weren't going to have kids. I, I, when I met her, I was already older. I was too old to have a kid. She had just got out of a marriage. She was newly divorced. 
So she was very happy and she still is. It's not like she's begging me to marry her and I'm saying, no, she has her own condo. I have my own condo. I did not know that. You you see another, really? (laughs) No, she lives in Pasadena. 19 years and you you don't live together? No, we did live together when I sold my first condo. I moved in with her and it just wasn't fun. So I said, do you mind if I get my own condo? She's like, no, that's a great idea. But we'll still see each other. I said, yes. Wow. So we get along great. When I worked at WABC, I worked with Joy Behar. And she used to have a very funny line. She'd say, I want a man in my life, not in my house. (laughs) And that's the way I feel. I love my girl. She's great. But I love the fact that I see her three or four days a week and two or three days a week I'm on my own. You feel it's because you've settled into your own routine and you don't want to compromise and create a new routine? I think that's it. And um, I'm very neat. Like when you come into my condo, it looks like a model home. Right, right. She works a little harder than me. She's in the food service industry. So her place is messy yeah. and it drives that me crazy. That would drive me crazy. She, it's not dirty. It's just right. messy. Right. She'll fold her laundry until it's eight feet high on right. the bed. Right, that's a red flag. <laughs> yeah. I mean, one of the reasons why I married my husband was because he's neat. I mean, the one thing he does have is he always puts his socks on the floor and they're there all night. But now I've learned that when I wake up in the morning, I put them in the laundry basket. Oh, that's not something. acceptable. Yeah. Uh, it's like the compromise you have to make. And the compromise he makes is I don't like to relax. I like to constantly be doing stuff and that stresses him out. Well, when we, I want to retire in a year or two. And we talk about getting married and living together because uh, it'll kill me if when I die, she doesn't get my social security. (laughs) Yeah. So we're figuring out how big does the house have to be that we move into. You know, I met a couple once and what they had was a duplex where one lived on one side and one lived on the other side. I like that. That was a great idea that they could still be together, but they had their own separate that's a, that's a good idea. Yeah, a duplex. I think a duplex. And, you know, I'm not going to stay in California because it's a little cost prohibitive. Right. Um, I keep looking. I'm on Realtor.com. It's my new go-to site. <laughs> it's like better than any porn site I've ever been on. It's like, oh, my God, a bonus room. <laughs> oh, my God. Look at this realtor. She's selling me a bonus room. Um a lot of these places are gigantic. They're yeah. 3,200 square feet for $400,000. Wow. I wow. could live in 3,200 square feet with, with someone yeah, that's, else. that's over the top. We could each have lot. our own bedroom. Right, right. You know what I mean? Yeah, Jake always wants to go to Costa Rica. That's his dream. Like So now I'm looking into it, buying Costa Rica. the land, right? And yeah. then eventually we can build You'll have it. We'll have it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and your kids are um, actors, they're actors. You're the perfect stage mom. Right. <laughs> Van's 11 and my is eight. And I only got started with because my girlfriend had her son at an agency and my daughter was super cute when she was one. And she said, you should put her in. And I was like, oh, can you make money? Yeah. Okay. Well, if you can make money, sure. And I thought their cuteness can only last for so long before they start looking weird. Right. So put them into acting and modeling now until that goes And when you say weird, that means like a normal two-year-old. No, like I'm talking, you know, when you become a tween or a teen and your body gets long, your face breaks out. So if you've got something you can sell, like, you know, then do it. Like when I got married, I'm like, you guys want to film somebody getting married, you can pay me to do it. When I got pregnant, I was looking at, you know, reality shows who would follow me while yeah. I was pregnant you see, so that's they could pay weird. me. <laughs> see, for somebody who doesn't talk, you're so out there they with stuff. They need to pay me. I know, but even like your Facebook posts are at it. Right. Like, <laughs> like, I don't, I'm not... You're not a Facebook friend of mine. You but, have cut off everybody on Facebook. But you, you know, people, we even have a group. People, what is it? Friends of Tony. Verdi. No, unfriended by Tony. <laughs> unfriended Verdi. by Tony. Yeah, Verdi. one of our editors wrote. He he put up a page, but you sh- you're an oversharer, like way too much. I don't think so. it's not anything that I wouldn't tell you in person, but because I don't speak to you, you don't know. <laughs> well, not just me. It's not you don't really speak to many people there. You don't let's. We work with 100 people or 50 people. Right, right. right. How many do you talk to? There's like, you know, I can name five that I speak to on a daily basis. So we're going to, the idea of this is probably that we're going to talk a little bit about us, but maybe bring somebody into it who's in the industry and 
kind of talk to industry people? Right. I'm that- very excited today. We're bringing in Jay Kogan. He is uh, an executive producer. He's a director. He's created shows. Jay's got a long history. His father was a comedian and a writer, too. So we're going to have a lot of fun to learn. I, I like comedy writers because... A lot of people will say to me, oh, you know, you're funny. You should do stand-up. And I go, no, funny with friends is one thing. Yeah, You can sit in a room if people have a drink in them, and you can make them laugh if you know them. You can make them laugh doing other people's material. But if you're writing comedy or doing stand-up, that is a completely different animal. I told my husband I've always wanted to do stand-up, and he said, you're not funny. I said, well, maybe I can work. And no, you're not funny. But it's tough to do. Yeah. I tried it I can twice. do the standing up and talking. I've got no problem with that, right? And there's no fear oh, there. Oh, no fear of that. Yeah, there's yeah. no fear of that. It's just the I'm not funny part that sucks. Well, I lived in Cleveland at one point, a really weird time of my life. Maybe we'll get to that another time. <laughs> and there, I was at the, the Cleveland Comedy Connection. Monday night, they had amateur night. Yeah. And at the time, I really, all my friends, I didn't know them. I met them in Cleveland, and they all thought I was funny. And I'm like, well, maybe they're right. The guys I grew up with think I'm funny. But if these guys think I'm funny, then I'm funny. So I remember the sound of being on not a lot of laughing. And at the time, they didn't give out plastic straws when you stirred the drink. They gave out those glass swizzle sticks. I remember hearing the ice being stirred in the drinks. And it it was dead silent other than that. And that was enough for me. Being a comedian must be so hurtful because you're putting yourself out there and you're getting immediately people saying, I don't like you. Yeah. So I want to ask Jay, I mean, I wonder if he's ever done it, if he ever went to an open mic and we should talk about, because comedy is a big, it's big, writing it, acting in it is difficult and... And he's a writer. Like I used to work for a screenwriter that Ed Solomon, who did Bill and Ted and all these big movies. And it was constant anxiety because he would turn in his work and they would turn around and have no problem. Be like, I don't like it. And it's like, (laughs) it's a rung his soul out because it's everything in you. And there's a person saying, I don't like it. Yeah. Yeah. Very subjective too. Right. 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 If you met Jay, yeah. At a, if I met him at a coffee shop, would I know he's a comedy guy? No. Oh, he'll be happy to know that. <laughs> you know what? He'll say something. He's not like, uh, you know, he's not Kevin Hart. He's not, you know, Robin Williams, like that funny. Right. He's a smart guy. Right. And when after a while you're like, oh, Jay is funny. It doesn't come out right away. He's not sarcastic like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. He's a guy that, you know, will make jokes and he's smart. And that's probably the key to being funny. Well, he'll be here soon. All right. So we want to welcome Jay Kogan to the show. He is a fantastic writer, director, executive producer. He's had a long list of hits. Plus his father, Arnie Kogan, was a big comedy writer. Right? Was and is, is a big yes. comedy You know, writer. I was thinking we should have invited him as well because he is fantastic. You know, screw him. I'm here. You don't need Arnie Kogan. <laughs> He's had his run. He's had his good time. Uh, we did. We did. We did a podcast together. We did one together. Uh, Gilbert Gottfried has a podcast that we did oh together. Oh, my God. Yeah. And it was fun. You should listen to it. It's really good. My dad's super funny. Tell me about when you knew your father was funny. Like, was it always in the home? Was it always last? Or is he just funny at work? And None of that. When you grow up with the comedy writer, you hate all the jokes. There's no, you're used to them. My kids, my son, I have a kid. I have a son. He, impossible to make him laugh. Or my wife. <laughs> they are sick of my shit. They don't care about it. They don't want to hear it. And and I am, they roll their eyes every time I do something that professionally I get paid lots of money for. But what about when you were growing up? When I was growing up, my dad was funny sometimes, but most of the time it was the same thing. I knew his shtick. You know, you get to know, if you saw the same stand-up every night, you stop laughing at the routine. You know, my dad played trumpet growing up, so he hung out with musicians. Mm -hmm. And they would tell, oh, do you remember when we were in Cairo, New York at this? And it was fun. I kind of got into it. But you're right. At 14 or 15, I heard the joke already about the roast or the same story right yeah exactly but but he was funny and he made other people laugh and he's particularly funny when he wrote stuff when i saw the work that he created right then i thought oh that's That's funny funny. and he's funny and he gives amazing speeches really funny wedding toasts and um speeches that he when he's asked to do uh any kind of speeches he's 
he's a genius and really smart and really funny. And I'm always impressed, like, holy crap, that's my pop. But <laughs> uh, just did sitting at breakfast, uh, no, not so much. Did you feel a lot of pressure for your son's, like, uh, bar mitzvah? Like, when you had to be, did you feel like you had to be funny? I uh, No. I felt like the, my, the goal there was to be, um, to be true to my heart and just say what was in my heart about my son. And if it happened to be funny, that's fine. Yeah. But I it just, and I didn't have a speech written. I just said. You're off the cuff. This was, yeah. I just said, this is how I'm feeling in that moment. When you were getting back to growing up, was your dad hanging out with coworkers? Were, was he hanging out with funny people? Did you, Always. like, Always. anybody, we, you grew up back east or you grew I grew up out here and, okay. um, uh, you know, his, his, his uh, uh, coworkers uh, other comedy writers were the people who used to come over and hang out and we would have a, you know, the people I'd meet and I'd meet kids of other comedy writers. Right. And, um, you know, I met a lot of other kids who wound up being in show business for the sake of, you know, they, they were connected. So we had, you know, we were very close with Stephen and Eadie. And oh, their kids. yeah, yeah, yeah. They are very close with um, the writers on The Carol Burnett Show and the writers on The Tonight Show and the writers of The Jim Neighbor Show and The Dean Martin Show and, and uh, you know, like celebrities – who at the time were like, you, I cannot believe that you know Vicki Lawrence, <laughs> right. who now yeah. nobody cares about or whatever, but, right. you know, or, or Tim Conway. You know, I knew Tim, we knew Tim Conway, and then I got to know Tim Conway Jr., who's my age and went to the same school. Yeah. And, right. and so, and he's really funny. And to so. us, he's hilarious. Tim right. Conway was the yeah. best. So when, at a certain point, did you know, like, Maybe I'll follow in dad's footsteps, or did you want to be a doctor? Did you want to get out of it? Oh, I wanted to be in show business right away. Like, when I was five years old, uh, dad uh, was working on the Dean Martin show. We had just moved to California from New York, and we got – they wanted kids to surround Dean Martin and Dennis Weaver – as they sang Christmas songs. <laughs> so oh, wow. way back. Yeah. So it was me and my sister, plus a bunch of other kids, including like Dom DeLuise's kids who all became actors and directors yeah, and yeah. Melissa Gilbert and her, like all those pe people right. who were Harry Crane's nieces and nephews. And um, uh, we were just sat around being in, seeing like, this is what a job looks like. Like we could not believe this is what work looked like. There's fun and there's food and there are people laughing and it's great. And then we would come and we came in for two days, one for rehearsal and one for the show. And the rehearsal was great. We met uh, McLeod, who was Dennis Weaver. Yeah. And then we met some dude who was not Dean Martin. Because Dean Martin didn't show up until show night. Right. And so we were just like, some guy was standing where Dean Martin will stand. And, and we thought that show was this other guy and, <laughs> and Dennis Weaver. And, and uh, eventually Dean Martin comes in and he does this oh great God. song with Dennis Weaver and winds up picking my, my sister up and singing right to her. And we thought, this yeah, is great. This is so I thought, I want to be in show business. I didn't think I would be a writer because that looked horrible. Uh, that looked boring. My dad spent hours and hours alone in his room typing and it looked miserable really? uh, and it by the way writing is miserable yeah. <laughs> it's a miserable profession uh but um the having written is great uh but it is it's a lonely sad struggle when you're writing and to watch my father do it felt sad I much i tried to be a sit uh, a stand-up comedian and an actor first and i always wanted to be an actor director uh, i still do right. uh but uh they started paying me for writing so what was I going to do? When you did stand up, I don't know if you were, if you thought you were good at it or not. Oh no! I told Teen I lived in Cleveland at one point, and I did a couple Monday nights at mm -hmm. the Cleveland Comedy Club, and it was devastating. Mm -hmm. Especially if you think you're funny and your right. friends like. Did, when you didn't do well at stand up, did I did well sometimes? You did. I just didn't think it was good. Okay. Like, there's a difference. Did you think that's the end of my comedy career at that point? Or did you say, all right, now I'll try to, you know... No, I, what, what happened was I was doing okay at stand-up. I had some lousy nights, but right. for the most part, I didn't care. Right. Um, you know, you sort of have to have a thick skin if you're going to go in that business anyway. Yeah. So I just did bits. and But my problem wasn't that I didn't think I was good. I, I, I wasn't good. I didn't have a great persona. Right. I couldn't develop that thing that I knew I had studied all this great stand-up comics right. in the world. And I knew you had to have a wonderful persona right. and it takes years to develop it. I didn't have it. Is it a shtick? What do you mean by well, persona? Well, yeah, persona, whatever your shtick is at the time, you know, like, I mean, the bad example, Roddy Dangerfield, they get no respect. Yeah. Um, if it's, it's Steve Martin, he's wild and crazy guy. Right. If it's right. Bob Newhart, he's sort of the stiff, 
right. button down guy and he's doing uh, voices on the uh, talking to people on the phone. Everybody he sort of has Very a right. thing. George Carlin sort of had, was at the time was kind of hippie ish and, and and left leaning. He had his thing. My thing at the time was I came out in an old tuxedo and a cigar and I used to complain. I was 16 and I would complain about these kids today. <laughs> And I was like an old Borscht Belt Catskills guy. That's, that's which, totally up your alley. Which, which, which I thought was that. funny, but it's not me. And it certainly doesn't doesn't translate to much. It's a sketch. I realized later now it's a sketch. But a not great a, sketch. Yeah. Not yeah. a stand-up comedian <laughs> as a 16-year-old. Tony, well, I grew up back East, so, and I'm older than everybody I work with. So... You know, guy, my dad used to watch Shecky Green and Henny Youngman on TV and, and Red Buttons and Charlie, that whole crew. Right. And that's who I grew up with. So if I mention Shecky Green at work, the kids look at me like, what? Yeah. But that's right. the stuff that molded me as, as a young, I'm 60. So, right. you know, I like some of that stuff. I knew all the old comedians as well, right. of the people of my generation and the people of the past generation. Right. And because I studied it, I loved right. it. Uh, so I had the same thing, but, uh, you know... Deciding, the, but the problem wasn't for me wasn't comedy. I I could figure that out. The problem was comedy clubs. Yeah, I being sixteen in a comedy club, I, even then I knew it was a bad idea. Yeah. Just a bad place for a sixteen year old to be. It was people smoking, uh, drugging, boozing. Yeah. You know the people I were meeting were pe problematic people. Sometimes with uh, alcohol addictions and other things. What did your dad think? Then, then my mom and dad had no idea, didn't care. It was like when you back then, they just said, yeah, come, come, come home when you come home. Yeah. Yeah. And nobody yeah. cared. There was no like cell phone or. Were you funny at home? I was funny at home. I, my parents think I was funny at home, but that was, that's a separate issue. But let me just finish the, the first point, which was when I, I figured out comedy club's no good, what's a better venue? And I thought uh, the Groundlings Theater where it's in the theater. Right. People are coming to actually see a show. They're not coming on dates to get drunk and stuff. And there were other people closer to my age, right. uh, the different, so that's, that's where I, I went there. But no, at home, I tried to be very funny because that's how I could get my father's attention, to right. be funny. Oh. And so. You know, I was telling Teen before you got here, one time I met Sandy um, Hackett, Buddy Hackett's son in sure. Vegas. Right. And he was the MC for a, the Showgirls of Magic kind of thing. At one of the, at the San Remo Hotel. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we had a nice conversation. I said, hey, I love your dad. And he, we were talking about funny. And he said, I said, are you either funny or not funny? He goes, oh, my dad talks about this with all the guys. He thinks you could make somebody funny. What do you, do you think you could make, because I talk to people who That's just. That's what thinks or Buddy? Sandy yeah. said he thought Buddy I felt that if you could teach somebody how to be funny, how to set up a joke, how to write a joke, how to, and I said, I, you know. Buddy was pretty mean to Sandy <laughs> over the okay. years. And there's stories of him being very rude and, and questioning right. Sandy's if humor. If he's funny or humor, not. Humor, exactly. <laughs> what um, do you think? I think that the idea, that the concept of humor and being able to tell a joke, anyone can tell a joke. Right. Uh, everyone knows what makes them laugh. Right. Um, I don't know that everybody's sense of humor is ubiquitous enough to make a lot of other people laugh. Gotcha. So it's really a question of taste. Right. So it, do you have the sense of humor, enough of a sense of humor that would be appealing to enough people right. to get, so it's everybody, every great comedian is hated by somebody yeah. right. and every yeah. horrible comedian is loved by somebody, but right. it's just the numbers game. Can you make a living being Karen Kilgariff, or can you make a living being? I think it's like in when Harry met Sally, when Carrie Fisher said, everybody thinks they've got good taste and a sense of humor, but not everybody can have good taste and a sense of humor. Well, that's, and I would disagree. Everybody has good taste for them. It's like, mm. what's good taste for for a, a maximum amount of people that, that, you know, I know some people who hate Ralph Lauren clothes. They just will not wear them. <laughs> but he's pretty successful, right? Yeah. Right. So is it good taste, bad taste, or is it just enough taste? You know, I'm looking at two pages of credits. You, you've done a million things. Writing comedy, I always found, and again, I'm just funny with my friends. I've had people say, why don't you write something and... I think the hardest thing for me to do is to think funny up here and somehow get it Translated. down on paper and have somebody read it and think it's funny. You've obviously mastered it. That's difficult. That's I a whole teach, different animal. I can teach people to write. I really can. I can teach people to write. I don't know that I can teach people to write um, 
everything hysterical. But lately, you don't have to be hysterical. <laughs> you just like things that are labeled comedies aren't all that funny anyway. Right. But I can teach people to write well, and that I can do. Are you talking structure? Or you think like punchline and structure, da-da-da? structure, good stories. Stories are everything in writing. Jokes are nothing. Jokes are completely expendable. They're the first things to go. It's structure is everything. Would you have a great story to tell? Do you have interesting characters that are compelling to tell them with? And if you have those two things, then, and it's supposed to be funny, the jokes will come. And if you have neither of those things, and don't care how funny the jokes are, it's going to be a shitty. Yeah. How many shows have you created, like from your brain created? Um, lots of pilots. The one show that I created that got on the air was called Wendell and Vinny. Right. And that was that's one that came from my brain onto a TV screen. Uh, and I've done some movies too, but but mostly, you know, I, every year I write two or three other pilots where I'm doing that. What's so. the harder thing, creating them or keeping them going for the season? Um. I don't know, they're both pretty hard. <laughs> I think I think they're both, you know, the same kind of passion and interest and excitement that requir- is required to create a show is required to keep it going. For all those things. Yeah. I mean, you, you, know, you, episodes, you have to get that, that amazing, interesting spark that says, this is a great show. And then you have to get that amazing, interesting spark. This is a great episode. Yeah. It's about, because it's about something. You have to find something that's about something that meaningful to you. If it's meaningful to you, then you know, okay, I know what the theme is. I know what the core is. I know what I'm trying to get down here. That's every single episode of television I've ever written and every single pilot I've ever written. It's about something. And if it's about nothing, then it's really shitty. When you're in a writer's room and you guys are banging it out, do you, or not everybody you work with obviously has your sensibility as to what's funny. Is that hard sometimes? Three people sitting down trying to make something work and yeah, your sensibility is different than teens. And- it's, it's interesting that, that a lot of the, uh, the shows I've worked on and when you go and hire writers, a lot of people think you want – to hire somebody with a unique and individual voice that's just out of the box. And my answer is no. I don't want to hire that unique and individual voice. I want to hire a voice that's kind of like my voice. What I really want are 12 brains that are exactly like mine that will think the kind of jokes that I like so that it will get in the script. Because I'm ultimately the last filter if I'm the showrunner. And I'm thinking, what would be good here? And if somebody can pitch an idea that I will like, then it might have been something that I might have thought of at some point. And if they, you know, that's yeah, good. Keep a consistent and time. I don't want people to keep pitching things that I'll never like because that's just keeping me from getting home to my wife and kid because yeah. I want to get home. I constantly want to get home. I want to go home and I say, what's going to get me home faster? And if you have to tell somebody over and over again, appreciate the joke, thank you, but it's not quite what we're looking for here. It's not quite the style. That's getting me home much later over time. And it's the job of the writer to sort of bend his or herself to the showrunner's point of view, their sensibility. And that's those are the jokes to get in. If you're a good writer, you do that. That's something I learned very quickly. And I was able to, that's one of the great lessons I learned when I was uh, learning how to write comedy. There's a, a, a guy named uh, Danny Simon, who was Neil Simon's brother. Yeah. Uh, they were writing partners on your show of shows. Danny was one of my first writing teachers. And he wow. gave me the assignment of like, wow. You got to write a page of jokes for Joan Rivers and write a page of jokes for Rodney Dangerfield and a page of jokes for uh, uh, Don Rickles. And so you have to change your mindset to not be what you think, but what they, their, their point of view, their style. Right. And the more you can change, the more you can reset your mind into what they're thinking, the better off you are. And by the way, it's the same skill you need to be able to write characters. So you think this character would say something different than that character. You have to switch your mind to be in the head of those different characters. You know, everybody has their favorite comedian, their their favorite musician, their favorite song, the perfect song. You know, like I, I can think of, I'm a Springsteen guy, right? Mm-hmm. Some of his songs are perfect to me. Is there somebody- What's the, be- what's the best Bruce Springsteen song? Well, I tell you, Brilliant Disguise, mm-hmm. I'm yeah. really okay. in love with right. because of what he was going through. Do you through. go to Bruce Springsteen concerts now? I've been to three of them. I haven't been lately. Okay. So I go to Bruce Springsteen concerts and when he plays Born to Run, okay. and it's an audience full of people in their 60s right. and 70s who are running nowhere. Right. There's yeah, nobody, yeah, yeah. Nobody's, nobody's running. getting on their motorcycle and getting out of this town. And, and he's barely running. <laughs> it's so sad. But, but did you have a favorite, like who was your perfect- Mine was Rodney, I because it was easy to memorize his stuff. Who was your perfect 
comedian? Like in a perfect world, who was your guy or woman? I don't, I, I honestly really? don't have one. There's so many. I just like, I like great comics. I think okay. comics are genius. I, I think Bob Newhart's a genius, okay. incredible genius. I think that that Carlin, there's nobody better than George Carlin. I think that that Rickles was very funny in his own way. I would never ever do anything that's ever like him, but he was his own unique brand of funny. I thought uh, Jackie Mason's really funny. I th I thought. Uh, um, Bill Cosby was really funny. I know people hate him now. But no, no, I hear you, though. He was really funny. Uh, and yes. So they were on your Mount abhorrent. Rushmore, those guys. Uh, yeah, but I mean, this I, my Mount Rushmore has 500 people on it. I, I mean, they're you. great comics all over the place. David Steinberg. I mean, people, they're odd, odd assortment of really funny, right. smart people. Do you feel like uh, there's some funny writers? Like, my favorite would be Neil Simon. He's like my ultimate favorite. But he's not a stand-up no, comedian. No, he, he's a... He's a, he's a writer, and yeah. he has a style of play or yeah. movie that you really like. And I think he's he and Nichols and May sort of oh reshaped the okay. second half of the 20th century in terms of what writing is. I got to be a little creepy with uh, Neil Simon. I sat behind him at a movie theater because his daughter invited me to a movie, and I was like, oh, my God, it's Neil Simon. Was it one I, of his movies? It was her movie. Oh, it was okay. Ellen's movie. It was okay. her first movie, Moonlight and Valentino. Uh -huh. And she invited me, and I sat behind him, and I – Touch the back of his hair. That is a little creepy. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I I just could not leave yeah. just not um Well, he was a genius. He was a genius. And I don't know how great his hair was, but he was, <laughs> his was his writing was pretty good. Was pretty yeah. Perfect. His See, writing was pretty good. I, I get you. I get that. He's your guy. Yeah, he's, yeah, yeah. He's amazing. Are you ever under any pressure now, being politically correct, to fill the writer's room with either women who may not be perfect for the job or somebody African-American? Or do you... You just get to go. Yes. No, I, you, you must You must be diverse in picking your writing staff always now. And they're not always the best people necessarily. You try to find the best people that you can. But here's the thing. Those writers, uh, women and, and diverse people have been deprived of the opportunity right. to get better over time because they hadn't gotten Absolutely. their shot in the first place. So now... They're a little greener and a little uh, uh, more raw and take a little bit more training sometimes. And so, yes, there are more experienced what? white guys <laughs> yeah. around to, to do things because they've had the chance. Now, hopefully, over the course of the next 10 years, there'll be a wide array of people, all with great experience, all with great ability. I mean, the talent's there in every group. The talent yeah. is there. It's just they had, don't have the experience. I've heard from a lot of older writers, actually, that says now there's a bias against them because they, they feel they're too old. They're not in touch with what's funny. Oh, well, that's always been. Yes, the age, ageism is a 100%. But it's so weird in writing. You would I think that it's not, that it's not necessary. I just don't, you know, why? Well, not, well here's why. If you're, if you're a network executive and you think your demo is between 18 and 35 right. and you're hiring a 60-year-old writer yeah. and you think, well, what does that guy know about what it's like to be 18 or 28 in today's world? Yeah. Right. Whereas a writer's job is to pretend to be whatever it is that person's going to be. So, of course, that person can pretend. It's, yeah. of course, but the ageism is there. And, you know, I listen, it's like everything else. If you're handsome, if you're young, if you're uh, fast-talking, you'll get more work, period. Because the people hiring you are human beings, and they are affected by those things. So mm -hmm. if you're... Do you have... Are you writing every day? No. No, I told you, writing's hard. Yeah. I know. Well, what, so are what, 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 are you, what are you doing now? What are you What are you doing now? What I'm doing a podcast today. That's something fun. Wow, that's. Uh, <laughs> I drove out to La Cunada. Yeah, <laughs> holy crap! It's beautiful here. Yes. Is there anything you're pitching these days? Yes. Okay. I have. I wrote. Uh, uh, um, well, for right now, I'm trying to get staffed on a show. Now it's staffing time. So I'm taking meetings. Today, I'm taking a few meetings of different pilots that may or may not become shows. But I'm meeting with the showrunners to say, do you need any, you know, older white male help <laughs> on that show? Because they have a lot of the shows are not available to me because they are they need uh, women, women or Latinas or whatever. Just, uh, you know, the content of the show is about women and Latinas. So they want more of those people right. on the show. That's a weird, that's a very weird but prevalent thing now that. If you are that thing, they think you can write to that thing better. And by the way, that's true of acting too. If you are a, 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 an actor, a, a straight actor, they won't hire you to play a gay person. Right. Uh, if you're a, a, a 
you know, I, I pitched a show recently about a handicapped person. They said, well, you know, you'll have to have a disabled person play the part. Yes. And I said, you, I can't just have a great actor, Daniel Day-Lewis or somebody play the part. No, it has Sorry, to be. Sorry, has to be handicapped. has to be somebody who yeah. really is that thing. Yeah, I know my friend posted on uh, Facebook the other day that she's offended because her son wears glasses, that people take headshots with glasses. I'm like, that's acting. Why? Why can you not wear glasses? Uh, it's a disability. I'm like, uh, now it's going too far. Well, it's, 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 it, it takes away the craft of acting and takes away the craft of writing. When you're an actor, you're there to be able to throw yourself into a character and become something else. Not exactly, you don't have to be who you are. Right. Somebody like Robert De Niro is supposed to be... Well, look at Daniel Day-Lewis in My Left Foot. Well, you're going to find I, somebody with cerebral palsy to play right. that role. So, but, and writing is the same way now that people would like a writer... Uh, to be that person. Now, I understand having an experience and a well of experience that's helpful to the show. So if you're, a, it shows about Latina women and you're not a Latina woman right. and you have to sort of figure out what the well of experience is there, that's something I but get. But you can give them a punchline. I mean. No, but I mean, it's also, you know, you do research and you figure out what you want to do. And if I was writing a show about Latina women, I would absolutely interview people and be part of, and incorporate those people into the world of the writing of the show. If it's oh me, my I'm not here. Rookie. Amateur. Amateur. I'm so sorry. At least mine was on a I'm buzzer. I'm sorry. All right. Sad. Moving on. All right. And, he, anyway, uh, I, I think some of that's appropriate, but for the most part, actors and writers need to be able to write whatever comes into their imagination. And that's the beauty of those, those art forms. I used to work for a screenwriter, I was telling him, and I felt like, uh, and I studied screenwriting, I went to USC, I have a master's degree in screenwriting. And it was just so sad. Like I said, you're writing and then you present it to somebody and it's like soul crushing when they <laughs> don't like it. Like I would have to drive, like when I had my boss, twice a week to therapy. And he had hit movies. He did Men in Black and right. Bill and Ted. I'm like, how do you do it? How do Ed you Solomon? Who is it? Ed. Okay. Yeah, it yeah. Okay, yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. All right. I love it. All right. So here's the thing. I used to be an actor. So talk about soul crushing. So- when I was an actor, I would walk into a room with 40 guys who looked exactly like me. Yeah. So I, if you walk into a room that with 40 guys like you, you know you're the type they want. They want you. Mm -hmm. And when you don't get the part, it's like, well, what was it about me they hated? Right. That clearly their type, there was something in my soul they hated. There was something about my, my, the core of who I am, the essence of my talent that they hated. That was soul crushing. When I got to be a writer later on and handed them a thing, at least they hated that thing. It wasn't me. It wasn't personal. Yeah. It wasn't as personal. Well, I just feel like it's so personal because you put like your time you do, in so but much. But it's not like they're saying, I don't like the thing you wrote. So I don't, I like you. I don't like the thing you wrote. You can, those two things can agree. Oh, but, interesting. But when you walk into a, a, an audition and they say, we like, that guy who's exactly like you, we yeah. don't like you. That's really hurtful. Who do you like writing for? Is there somebody you've liked writing you mean for? A specific actor? Yeah, a specific yeah. actor, a specific. There are great, there's a, a plethora of amazing actors, all of whom make my work so much better than it really is. So I've, when, when you work on a show like Frasier, those actors, they imbue the line with real life. They imbue the line with reality that you didn't write. Like I may have written it, as a toss off joke and they give it life yeah. and they give it reality and it makes it so much better. And there's a moment in a script where you're writing that, that uh, Niles is thinking, Niles is thinking about something and then you see David Hyde Pierce really think about something and it's funny. It wasn't supposed to be funny, but David Hyde Pierce makes it funny because he's so good. Right. He's so charming. And you also see the wheels spinning. That happens throughout my career. I've had wonderful actors doing amazing things that make my work so much better. And conversely, I've had terrible actors who can't bring off anything right. because there's no reality. There's no sense of, of, uh, of, of thinking behind it. There's just awkwardness or something else that's just stopping it from being funny or real. And there's often no amount of helping that. You have to just change the words and change what they do and, and write to whatever strength they have, if anything. You know, you would think people who are watching TV, who know nothing about TV or people in TV, they see a 22 minute show, a half hour show. They think, well, that, that's easy. But everybody has to kind of overachieve to make it a great show. I always tell people the, the, the worst show on TV 
there are hundreds of people working extraordinarily hard to put that on. Right. <laughs> you know, the, very, your, the least favorite thing, the thing right. you hate, the thing you wish was canceled tomorrow. Right. There are people sweating bullets right. and staying up weekends and all nights to put it out to try and make it as good as it can be. So it, it's, there, there is a magic alchemy to making something that's great and making something that's crappy. And sometimes the difference between the two is just a roll of the dice. Right. But you know, when we're talking about those actors, some actors get hired not because they're good actors, but because they look a certain way or they, they're from a, a stand-up They've got a comedian. name. They're famous for some other reason. And they're put into a show and they're expected to be an actor or be talented. That's just how it is. We're stuck. When, you, when I'm not hiring, when I'm just the person sort of helping to write, I, we have to sort of find the best way to use that person. Do you find it more difficult sometimes to work with adult actors or children actors? Because I know like you did School of Rock and Wendell and Vinny. How are those kids? Those kids were great. They worked like, they worked so great and they were all wanted to get better and they all wanted to be, they all wanted to have careers in show business yeah, or not all, but most of them. And, and that's the thing. When you work with kid actors or when you hire kid actors, that's a big thing you make sure the kid really wants to do this. Right. It's not the mother is forcing this kid, yeah. go earn a living for the family. It's right. the kid wants to do it because nothing worse than having a miserable kid who really just wants to be in school yeah. working for you. Have to, there are some kids who really want to be working actors. Oh, they love it. They're few and far between, but they exist. And when you give that kid a chance, they want to work. That they love it. You can see it. Yeah. It's it's so different. Like my son is like, he's there for the paycheck and he's like, I'm going to be an engineer. So this is my last year. But he has friends who are like, they are into every audition and they're going right. there and they're putting it in. And they can't wait. And they want to do it as adults. I said, yeah. You yeah. give them a chance, please. Just don't yeah. do it anymore. Right. Exactly right. So you'll see. I mean, so, but kids and adults are the same to me. Uh, you know, I, I've met really talented kid actors who, who work from their heart. And I've met really uh, untalented adult actors who just waiting to go home. So. Sometimes the adult actors are harder because they there's a desperation there, like they gotta get the job, and so when they go do an audition, it's a little different. Kids oh. are kind of like take it easy, you know. It's not their well. The audition process life. is different than the working process. There's lots of people who audition poorly who are genius actors mm -hmm. and could and vice versa there are lots of great auditioners who then show up on the day is like you're horrible what happened to the person yeah. in the room there's just two different things is it work are they not putting in the work or is it just no there's there's a different it's a different skill to be good at an audition than it is to be good in a, as an actor in a tv show see like i never tested well but i'm smart you know i would always <laughs> do, I, I do horrible on every test i that a school ever gave i did horrible but somehow i you know I figured it out. Audition is nerve wracking. You're being judged. You know, yeah. there's a panel of people judging you and, you know, you can be nervous and it's a small room. It's not a theater. It's not, you're not on camera. You're not in costume. Mm -hmm. There's lots of things that you have to make up for yourself as an actor to sort of make it, and you have to have a good energy and you have to be sweet and look like you appear to be fun to work with. There's lots of yeah. things going on there. Whereas when you already have the job, you don't have to worry about any of that other stuff, you just have to be in that character. Living out here, every female server I have, you could tell who you know who's an actress, and it's most of them. They're so together. They're so good. They're they're selling you the soup. They're <laughs> selling you the. Uh, they're really good. And I always say to my friends, I bet you they interview well. Like I bet you they really do well. Oh yeah, it's, it's a great it skill. It becomes a part of their it's fabric. A great skill. Are you are you on that? Um, you you go in for a lot of stuff. You said you're taking meetings today. Mm -hmm. Do you go in with a certain gravitas? Like oh, this guy's great. He's been around. Like do you get that respect from people? Do I have gravitas? Yeah, I mean you must. Do I look like I have gravitas? I think you do. <laughs> I'm a baseball cap? No, I have no gravitas. No, you're just am, going in. I'm gravitas free. I don't know. I have I have very. I don't, uh, you know, listen, I grew up in show business. I have no, I, it's, it's, a, it's a luck of the draw. It's a roll of the dice. Any success I've had is not because of my genius. It's because I got lucky. And that's just the truth. Everybody else, there's so many talented people out there who didn't get the same breaks I did. Right. And so you just walk in and you say, and you talk to people and you see if you connect and hopefully you can pitch in funny jokes and have some good ideas about the show you're working on and hope they like you. That's it. What job did you have where your dad was like, but you're a writer, Jay? I My first job. Yeah. Working on the Tracy Ullman show. He couldn't believe it. He was just like, great. I mean, actually, uh, you know, the fact that I got a job as a writer, he was thrilled because I had been, you know, production assistant up until that point. That was the, and, and, uh, you know, as a, as a parent, my son's musician, um, 
I'm going to send him to college and spend half a million dollars to get him to college. And when he comes out, he'll be playing at a Waffle House. <laughs> so I'll be, if he makes money as a musician, I will be thrilled to death. Like, I can't believe he, my dad said to me, don't be a writer, be a agent, be a manager, be a producer, be something else that's uh, a, a safer paycheck mm -hmm. because you want security for your kid. Yeah. So when I finally got my first writing gig with my partner at the time, Wally Walidarski, he was thrilled. And he said, great, keep it up. And then when I got the opportunity to write on The Simpsons, he was devastated because he said, a cartoon, you'll ruin your career. Yeah. Yeah. Who knew that? Well, he, at the time, that was the the, the current wisdom was a, 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 a primetime cartoon is not as classy and not as smart as you just were on an Emmy yeah, award-winning sketch, comedy. Right. sketch right. comedy show. Well, it wasn't the Flintstones. So do you take meetings as a, um, is it just what you do? I have scripts to write. I have stuff to do. I have some writing to do today. Okay. I'll do that at some point. I'll find a split. Wait, wait, but didn't you just get rid of your agent who's setting up these meetings? Uh, I am, and my manager, and my lawyer, all the people that, other people that are doing that, who always did it anyway. Yeah. But uh, yeah, the the firing the agent thing was a drag. I, tell tell Tony what's going on. You don't know what's going on with the, um, all the writers are firing their agent. Oh, no. I, I, I heard about this. Yeah, yeah tell no, us I a know. little bit about I know. that. It's, a little, it's tough. Well, it used to be that uh, an agent was your advocate. And if you got a job, that agent would get 10% of your money. Right. Over the past 50, 75 years, the agencies have been taking an extra cut of the pie by if a creator creates a show, the agency gets a fee on top of that called a package. So they get money from uh, a certain percentage of the budget of the entire show. Plus, if it goes into syndication, they get a certain chunk of the profits of that show. So, And that deal is separate from the person they represent. Mm -hmm. So they can create a shitty deal for the person they represent and a great deal for them as an agency. Uh, and so, so we're saying, saying and, and consequently over time, our deals as writers have gotten worse and worse and worse. And their deals as gotcha. agents has gotten better and better and better mm -hmm. because they have their own personal interest in that. We're saying we need to align our interests so that agents are now actually working for writers and that when the, when writers do better, agents do better. Otherwise, what's the point of having an agent? That we're not in the business of paying 10% to an agency and then having them just not care about us and not represent us. Right. So, And the agencies are saying, well, we don't care. We're making too much money this other way. Right. So, And where what are you going to do? Not have agents? And we said, yeah. yeah. Right. Not have agents. I mean, or find somebody else, assign, find agents who are willing to work with us the way we think they should do. Because basically we're paying them like we pay gardeners. We wouldn't have our gardeners threaten us to say, what are you going to do? Not have a gardener? It's like, yeah. 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 Well, get a different gardener. Yeah. I'll get somebody else. So that's that's the big issue. They're, they're not aligned with our interests. Plus, there's another wrinkle that just happened recently. They started becoming production companies. Right. So they started making movies and financing movies and then hiring writers. So if you're my boss... And but you're also my agent. You're supposed to make my deal right. for me at this company that you own. Are you really going to make the best deal for me, or are you going to make the best deal for you? Of course, you're going to make the deal for you. They don't have a fiduciary. They're not acting as if they have a fiduciary responsibility to the client, which they do by law, and they're sort of throwing that out the window. So we're trying to figure out a way that agents can make a ton of money. We want agents to make. Oodles and oodles of money. We just want it to be aligned with the writer's interests. Right. How much is it hurting you not having an agent? Can you just rely on your it's manager? It's super weird. And, and and I can't. I have to call friends myself. I have to do a lot of legwork myself. And it's super weird. I love my agents. And I love the people I work with. And I love my agency. So it's, it's very strange and, and a little sad. But I understand why we're doing it. We're doing it to protect writers now and writers in the future. Always... Writers are always striking for writers in the future. We're never we're striking for ourselves. We're always losing money. Anytime we go on strike or anytime we do something like this, it always hurts us in the present. But hopefully it'll hurt. It'll help somebody in the future. Well, Jay, I, I, I'm i sure you'll land. Uh, I don't know if you'll land on you. I hope you land. <laughs> I hope things I work out. Thank you. Okay. Jay Kogan been around for anything on right now on TV land or anywhere that that you that you've worked on that still holds up that we could watch. Well, yeah, I mean, where the the good shows are still always on. The Frasier and and everybody loves Raymond and Malcolm in the Middle and The Simpsons. Great and, shows, and they're all on. They're all on all the time. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Okay. You know, we've got a little bit called Fifteen Seconds of Fame, where we uh, try to locate where you've been on TV. What's a little time that you've been uh, as an actor on TV that we could try to find? 
uh, on YouTube. Well, there's... What's the show? And then we're going to try to have our guests have okay, the uh, well, people listen. I was on the Bob Newhart show. Oh, when wow. I was, when I was young. What was, do you remember what the scene was? Of course. Was? Okay, tell us, tell us. I can tell you the episode. Number, I can make it easy for you. It was number 126. <laughs> uh, my, it's an episode my father wrote of the Bob Newhart show. He, I played a character, not coincidentally, called Jay. Uh, and it was an episode entitled My Business is Shrinking. And Bob Newhart, so, for some reason, his client, he's a psychiatrist, uh, his client base was slowly shrinking. People weren't coming to him. And... Marsha Wallace, who's the receptionist, was saying, well, it's the economy. Nobody's spending money on anything. And at the same time, Jerry, the dentist, his office is jam-packed with people. <laughs> and I, so, so much that uh, one of his patients, Jay, has to sit out in the larger waiting room. And Bob Newhart has nothing to do. So Marsha Wallace asked me, do you want a magazine? And I say, no, thank you. And then Bob Newhart stares at me and says, you want to talk about it? <laughs> <laughs> We had well, thank you. It was a pleasure meeting right. you. Good Thank luck you. to you, man. Oh, you may hug. Bye-bye. Oh, they hug. Oh.